Once we have the connection fully modelled and we've configured the numerical and code settings, we can do the calculation. In this case, I've left this parameter, stop at the strain limit, deactivated, so that you see the difference between using it or not. So we're going to launch the stress strain analysis. And in this case, I've implemented, um, as you can see here on the side, two load cases, because I also want to show you the special features of this analysis when we're working with different combinations. And here we have it. Just by calculating, we straight away get this display in the program interface with this small summary and this graphic representation. But in order to really be able to analyze the results, to see all the possibilities that we have, we need to go to the general check tab. On this tab, the following options appear. On the one hand, a series of visualization tools with which we can specify what type of results or what graphics we want to visualize. And this graphic window is where we're going to see the results, shown on the connection itself. As I mentioned, I also have a small segment with a summary of this check. On the other hand, I'll have a series of windows where I can see the results in greater detail. That is, in addition to this graphic representation, I'm also able to see here results in a detailed numerical format. We will, of course, see this part further on. And for the moment, we're going to concentrate on the graphic part. So it's appropriate to mention here that in some cases in which we're evaluating various load combinations, we have two different ways of viewing the results. On the one hand, we can visualize them for the extreme load combinations, i.e. for each component we'll see the state of stresses and strains for the extreme load of all, lo all those loads that we've included. But on the other hand, we can also view load combination by load combination the results for each of them. To explain, if you look at the status of this connection, and in a moment we'll see what it is, and this check summary, both the summary and the status is for the load combination LE1. If I go to LE2, here I'd have the result corresponding to this combination. However, when I select the extreme load, the program displays results as though it were for the envelope, as though for each of the forces it was the critical load in each case. Going now to the summary section, we see that we have different fields. On the one hand, we have an analysis check and a percentage. This parameter tells us what percentage of the loads that I introduced has been applied in the connection. And for this percentage, what status the plates, bolts and welds have. In terms of the plates, this status is generated from the plastic status because, as you've seen, when we work with finite element programs, the check criteria for the plates is the limit plastic strain. We limit it to 5%. Therefore, in those cases in which the plastic strain is greater than that value, the plate will not check since it won't satisfy this condition. In terms of the bolts and welds, a utilization percentage is provided i.e. 100% would be the maximum capacity of this bolt or weld, and it gives us a utilization percentage of this maximum capacity of the component. So what's the problem here? What I'm seeing is that the connection does not satisfy the check. That is, neither the plates nor the bolts nor the welds satisfy the check. But now, when I need to start reinforcing this connection, where would I start? what has been the limiting factor. With this type of result, I don't know where I need to start reinforcing. I know that, clearly, the problem is in the area of the stub, but first the bolt, the plates, the welds, I wouldn't know. Therefore, I do the following, and this is what I always advise. In the code setup, I activate this stop at strain limit option. I click accept, and we're going to recalculate. And here I have it. Now I have a second way of displaying this analysis. If you look at the first field of this analysis, I'm getting a percentage below 100%, and it's telling me that it doesn't satisfy the check. Of course it doesn't. As this field is telling me, this model is only capable of absorbing 80% of the load that I've applied. Specifically, if I go to this analysis section, we can see that this AT is the limiting factor for the combination LE1. For the combination LE2, as we've already seen, the connection is capable of taking the full load.
However, when one of the combinations doesn't satisfy the check with 100% of the load, it shows me it in red. Although it doesn't satisfy the check, the interesting thing here is that the percentages for the plates, bolts and welds that the program is giving me now are percentages based on this maximum load step that the program has applied. So this tells me, clearly, what the limiting factor has been in the analysis, why the calculation has stopped and hasn't been capable of introducing any greater load. In this case, for example, we're seeing that the welds are already practically at their limit. Lastly, a field that I've mentioned before, and that we'll see further on, is the buckling field. It says it hasn't been calculated because, in reality, it hasn't been. I haven't done this type of analysis. When we see in the following chapters how the buckling analysis is done, we'll come back to this summary and we'll see what value the program generates for us in this field. In terms of the graphic representation, the first thing that I have as soon as I calculate the connection is this schematic which is called a traffic light type schematic. What is this traffic light type? It's a representation with which, just at a glance, without looking at anything else, without analysing stresses and strains, with a graphic of simple colours, informs me about the working status of each of the various components of the connection. In grey, it shows me the elements that, although they are working, are doing so below what is called the optimum range. In green, it's showing me the elements that are in the optimal range. In orange, it shows me the elements which, although they satisfy the check, are very close to the limit i.e. with a little more load, they would fail. Therefore, in this case, in which the connection has not been able to absorb more load, what I'm seeing with these orange welds is that it's these welds in particular that have stopped the calculation, not those that I have in green, nor those in grey. These here are the critical ones. And finally, as before, when I calculated without using the stop at strain limit option, now, if I calculate without using that option, stop at the strain limit, the program would show me in red those elements that were above 100%, i.e. that wouldn't satisfy the check. So now I've talked about optimal ranges, um, and about ranges that are at the limit. But how are these ranges defined? If you remember, here in code setup, I have these values that generate for me a warning level. This warning level for those elements that are close to the limit but that still satisfy the check is set by default at 95%. An optimal level means working above 60%, i.e. those bolts whose utilization percentage is between 60% and 95% the program will show in green because they are considered to be in the optimal range. And it will show me in grey the elements that are working below the 60%. Evidently, I can modify these values, because perhaps in my case, an optimal range is elements working at above 70%. So in this case, I can modify it so that the program shows me in green those elements with the utilization above 70%. So what's the use of this, of being able to view this graphic with colors? In a straightforward way, I could see, for example, that in this case, the stiffeners, which are in gray, are working below the optimal range, and so perhaps they're not necessary. Perhaps I could think about doing a second analysis in which I eliminate them, I calculate again, and I see if the connection satisfies the check. If the connection checks, it means that, in fact, the stiffeners aren't necessary, and there's no reason for me to use them. Or, perhaps, they are necessary from the point of view of limiting the stress and strain of these flanges of the column, but their thickness could be greatly reduced. There's no reason to use such a large thickness given that, with the thickness that I've just specified now, these stiffeners have a utilization percentage that is very low. Equally, I could see the check for the plates. As we've said, as this is a finite element program, it works with plastic strain. I have a similar schematic, also of the traffic light type, with these strain percentages for the plates. Here I have this gradient, and it's telling me the same thing. In grey, what's it showing me? It's showing that these plates, or zones of plates, 
are working below the optimal range. In this case, they are plates that are only working in the elastic range, i.e. that haven't yet reached the point of yielding. The plates that are working in the optimal range are shown in green, which means, in this case, by default, between 0 and 3% of plastic strain. Again, why 3%? It's because it's the value that I've specified for the plastic strain warning. So in orange, it'll show me a critical plastic strain, close to the limit, between 3 and 5%. And in red, it'll show me those elements, or parts of elements, whose plastic strain exceeds 5%, and therefore don't satisfy the check. But the program doesn't only do it with the plates. It also does it for the welds. Notice that, for the fillets of these welds, here this orange part appears, for example. The program is also checking their plastic strain. Why? Because the program considers welds with plastic redistribution of forces, i.e. it takes into account the plastic range of the material of the weld, and therefore it also has to check them using this condition of limit plastic strain. Other types of results. One of the most interesting, at least from my point of view, is the distribution of stresses along the connection. These are von Mises stresses. As you'll know, when we work with plates, the von Mises stresses can be obtained for the top face, the bottom face, we could even obtain them for the intermediate fibres. The program evidently does it like this. Either it has different layers, or it has different strands of stresses within each plate and it always shows me the extreme state, which, in the end, will be those used to check the element. Why do I say that it's perhaps one of the most interesting results from my point of view? It's because it's the first results with which I check if, in fact, the results that I have are coherent or not. Until now, I've showed you the results that the program provides, but at no point have I seen if they are more or less coherent. I've assumed that they're accurate, and that's it. In this case, with this distribution of stresses, I can analyze whether the behavior is as expected. For example, if around the bolt holes we have critical points where stresses accumulate, which is an obvious outcome, or that the welds, depending on how they are working, also have critical points of stresses, and so on. Just as I can show these stresses, I can also show this distribution of plastic strains. Now, instead of using the traffic light type graphic that I showed you earlier, it's done with a gradient of plastic strain. Again, the same. I need to see if it's coherent. Where are these plastic strains going to be located? Well, for example, around these bolt holes. What concretely is it showing me in this case? It's showing where this bearing, this plastic strain, is produced due to the interaction between the plate and the bolt. So. This is one way, when we work with a finite element model, of checking the bearing that the bolts produce on the plates. And, of course, as well, look at the fillet of the weld. Here it's telling me that it also has a plastic strain, which is getting close to the limit, as we've seen before. This is for the forces that I've applied, and now we'll see if, in fact, this behaviour is coherent or not. In addition, either superimposed on the plastic strain results or on the results of equivalent stresses, I can see the distribution of forces in the bolt. That is, this distribution of forces with which the program then does the bolt check. Note that this is often surprising because with the forces that we apply, when we calculate the connection manually and we split this bending moment into a couple of forces and we analyze what part corresponds more or less to each bolt, and it's surprising when we see the results because, even in the bottom bolt, that with this bending moment should apparently be working in compression, it's surprising to see that this bottom bolt is also working in tension. This is due to these plates that I've put here being too flexible, and so the hinge point, the point of rotation, is not produced in an intermediate part of the plate. Instead, it's produced in the bottom part. How do I see this behavior properly, the behavior that I've just explained? If I use this view here, deformed, which is another type of view that's available, then this deformation can be observed well. 
I advise you to also visualize the mesh so that you have a more realistic geometry. Look, note how this point is being pulled. It seems like tension on the bolt, but, however, in this other part where it's being compressed, these bolts don't have tension, which is what we'd expect. Notice too that with this deformed view, I can also check if this weld, in this area where the bracing is produced, has a plastic strain close to the limit. The visualization of the mesh is something that appears in all finite element programs. It's something basic to see the mesh that it's producing. But what we'll also know about the results that we've seen is if they're more or less realistic. What does this mean? Probably you've already got some understanding of this. When we're working with a finite element program, although when I show the distribution of strains, I see a smooth continuous distribution, in truth, in the internal calculation, the program has only calculated the stresses in the nodes of the mesh, in this intersection of lines. The rest of the values, these that appear shaded, will simply be a smooth, linear, quadratic distribution. This depends on the algorithm of each program, but an interpolation of results. The real exact results will only be in these nodes. Therefore, let's imagine that in this beam, instead of having four small squares in the flange, I only had two. Then, for these intermediate points of the flange, I would have no way of knowing what actual results for stresses they would have. So, if in equivalent stresses I saw that the behaviour was more or less coherent, I would see this smooth distribution of stresses, but the results wouldn't be realistic, they wouldn't be coherent. So here we have the problem that always arises when working with finite elements. What mesh do we make? Evidently, if I make a mesh with very small elements, I make many elements, and I would have more results. It would be much more detailed, and the behaviour would be much more realistic. However, making a very small mesh implies an excessively long duration for the analysis. And, in reality, the difference in the results reach a point at which it's not significant. As much as we refine the mesh, we don't gain much precision. The results remain constant. So, we don't need to go overboard with this question. Simply, you need to be aware of this possible consideration we always have to make various elements for each of the plates. Making just one element wouldn't be the solution. Equally, be aware that the program already has implemented in its internal code this type of consideration, and note that around the bolts, which are critical points of stress concentration, the program automatically generates for me a mesh that is much finer. It wouldn't be such a thick mesh as that, for example, in the flange of the beam or in the flange of the column. This is in terms of the graphic part of the results. As I mentioned to you, I've got two ways of visualizing the results, both for the extreme load combination and for a specific load combination. If you look, I'm going to switch between the stresses for the load combination one and here for the load combination two. I'll have the same, but here, corresponding to the second combination in which everything does satisfy the check. In addition, I have two ways of doing the analysis. One is applying 100% of the load, no matter what, and the other is applying load steps until one of the components stops satisfying the check, until one of the components fails. So in this case, I always advise you to activate this stop at strain limit option in order to be able to evaluate in a more detailed and intuitive way which is the limiting component due to which the connection is not able to take the full load that you've introduced.